Um, shall we dive into readings as planned? Okay, all right. So um, thank you everyone for being here. Um, my name is Mekha Majumdar. Um, I wrote this book, which is my first book. It's called A Burning. And I'm delighted to chat with Marie, who wrote this gorgeous book called Parakeet, which I am devouring. Um, before I jump into a short reading, I just wanted to take a second to acknowledge that um, this is a really difficult time. We are in the middle of an uprising. And if you are here and you are bringing grief and sorrow and anger with you, then I hope this um, 45 minutes or hour of conversation about fiction and storytelling um, provides you some rest and some energy. Um, so with that, I'll just read a little bit from A Burning. You smell like smoke my mother said to me. So I rubbed an oval of soap in my hair and poured a whole bucket of water on myself before a neighbor complained that I was wasting the morning supply. There was a curfew that day. On the main street, a police jeep would creep by every half hour. Daily wage laborers compelled to work would come home with arms raised to show they had no weapons. In bed, my wet hair spread on the pillow. I picked up my new phone, purchased with my own salary, screen guard still attached. On Facebook, there was only one conversation. These terrorists attacked the wrong neighborhood. The more I scrolled, the more Facebook unrolled. The night before, I had been at the railway station, no more than a 15 minute walk from my house. I ought to have seen the men who stole up to the open windows and threw flaming torches into the halted train, but all I saw were carriages burning, their doors locked from the outside and dangerously hot. The fire spread to huts bordering the station, smoke filling the chests of those who lived there. More than a hundred people died. The government promised compensation to the families of the dead, 80 thousand rupees, which, well, the government promises many things. In a video to the dozen microphones thrust at his chin, the chief minister was saying, let the authorities investigate. Somebody had spliced this comment with a video of policemen scratching their heads. It made me laugh. I admired these strangers on Facebook who said anything they wanted to. They were not afraid of making jokes. Whether it was about the police or the ministers, they had their fun and wasn't that freedom? Then in a video clip further down the page, a woman came forward, her hair flying, her nose running, her eyes red. Into the microphone she screamed. There was a Jeep full of policemen right there. Ask them why they stood around and watched while my husband burned. I shared that video, I added a caption. Policemen paid by the government watched and did nothing while this innocent woman lost everything. I wrote, I laid the phone next to my head and dozed. When I checked my phone next, there were only two likes. A half hour later, still two likes. Under my thumb, I watched post after post about the train attack earn. 50 likes, 100 likes, 300 likes. Nobody liked my reply. And then in the small glowing screen, I wrote a foolish thing. I wrote a dangerous thing, a thing nobody like me should ever think, let alone write, forgive me, ma. If the police didn't help ordinary people like you and me, if the police watched them die, doesn't that mean, I wrote on Facebook, that the government is also a terrorist? I'll stop there. Yay, Mega. That was beautiful and chilling and so prescient. So prescient. Thank you for sharing Thank that with you, us. Mary. I just finished a burning earlier today. And so having just finished it, I want to tell Jivan, don't do it. Don't comment. Don't write it. I just want to uh, 
I want to stop her and I can't hearing that first chapter again. That was beautiful. Thank you. From the internet to the internet, different kind of internet. Um, I think it's interesting that both of our novels begin with the virtual space and the unknown dangers around it. I'm just gonna read the first couple pages of Parakeet. What is the internet? One week before my wedding day, upon returning to my hotel room with a tube of borrowed toothpaste, I find a small bird waiting inside the area called the antechamber and know within moments it is my grandmother. I recognize the glittering hematite eyes, the expression of cunning disapproval. The odor of a gym at close of day encircles her. What is the internet? The bird says, does not say. Her head is the color of warning, sharp curve, yield yellow. The eyes on either side of the Cro-Magnon crown are lined the way hers were, in shoddy cornflower pencil, as if to say, really look here. Her hair, that had throughout her life hurled silvery messages skyward, has been replaced by orderly navy stripes that emanate down her pate like ripples in silk. Under the beak where her unpronounced chin would have been, four regal feathers pose each marked by an ebony dot. She hovers inches above the sofa's back, chastened and restless by her new form. The toothpaste lands with a dull thud on the carpet. I'm silent when stunned, no getting me to talk. What is the internet? My grandmother, the bird, insists, speaking as if we are in the middle of a conversation, which, in a way, we are. She had called to ask this question 10 years before. At the time, I considered explaining the technological phenomenon, but she was so old. What would be the point, I reasoned, of telling her about the show priming to begin after her exit? There have been many times in my life when encountering an opportunity to do good for reasons of shyness or shock, an unwillingness to leave a safe perch has made me balk. I told my grandmother the internet was solely for engineers and that its effect on society would be nominal. <laughs> and the following day, she climbed a ladder poised against her house, meaning to hammer a warped shingle. Something like a phone call, we were never certain, summoned her. She misremembered the ladder and fell from the roof. After she was gone, every room was a nothing room. I don't regret letting others rush forward to care for strangers in need. I don't regret calling my brother a little shit on his wedding day. However, lying to my grandmother about the internet placed a painful pebble at the bottom of my stomach that would not go away. Now my second chance claws the rim of a water glass in present internet rich day, as alive as the rest of us, trying to sip through her beak and failing. It turned out to be more influential than I led you to believe, I say. No shit, she says. Tasked with explaining it, I realized how little I know about the internet. It began as numbers on a screen. I make a blurping sound to signify dial-up and explain that it grew from a device only a few people had to Wi-Fi, which I think is in the air. I gesture to indicate exploding. Network names showcase a defining feature of the user. The Scotty worshiper, sad oboe girl. Even as a bird, my grandmother's dubiousness is unmistakable. The cocked avian focus, doubting me. When she was alive, she preferred staying in her slippers all day and the term shove it up your ass to anything. Maybe even to my grandfather, who over time became a scudding booted shadow in the house's secondary rooms, in the garage, winding a clock, in the spare bedroom, repairing an outlet. Shove the clock, shove the outlet. If my grandmother mother ever regretted slicing into another's feelings like fondant, she never admitted it. Any room containing her was merry, and this was a big deal for me since most of my childhood felt panicked and serious. She'd listen and move her eyebrows in a way that corrected my perspective. With a gaze, she could lift me older. I've come a week early to this inn on the shaft of Long Island to prepare for the transition from woman to wife to do what the groom calls decompress, because of late, I've become a bit of a nightmare to break apart if necessary, but to do so properly amid slatted pool chairs and conference coffee. 
I'm 36, ethnically ambiguous, and hold an intense job I do not like, biographer of people with traumatic brain injury. I present their lives in court using storyboards and dioramas. Everyone is thrilled I'm getting married. No one can believe I found such a sweet man. Everyone adores the treats sold in this town that are hybrids of bagels and flatbread. Flagels. I'm not sure if you're aware what day you've landed on. I speak to the bird in the graded voice you employ for a guest who's arrived too early. It's Sunday. I'm getting married in six days. I gesture to the migration of folded cards that cover the carpet in ecru V's, anointed with all I can recall from high school calligraphy. Have you come to wish me well, I say, but knowing her, my tone contains no hope. Of course I know you're getting married. The edges of her projection spit and haul. Do you think I'm here to ask about wires in a box? She goes transparent and her skeleton shows blinding bright. Then whatever debatably divine force is conjuring her regains composure and she is opaque again. There's something I want you to do. Marie, I loved hearing you read. Um, this is just a book that I just completely fell into as I started reading. I was so taken aback by its really minute and careful examination of family and friendship and the many slights and indignities and insults that we are aware of but that we suppress in order to go on and live. And yet you talk about these things which ring so true with so much humor. There were so many lines in this book that made me laugh. And it just felt like such a special, hypnotic, very strange in the best way, book to just kind of fall into during this time. Thank you for the reading. Thank you, Vega. That's awfully sweet of you to say. Um, so I guess we can uh, chat about our books, but can I just remind everybody watching that there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you would like to jot down your questions there, we will take questions in a bit. Um, but can I ask you a question which, um, I think a lot of people are wondering, how did this idea of a grandmother appearing as a bird come to you? <laughs> I was very much missing my own grandmother. And I also really like birds. Oh my gosh, this is the worst answer to this question so far. And I was, I was very much missing my grandmother's voice in my life. And she was a very irreverent woman, um, not a conventional woman of any, of any way, shape, or form. Um, and I had already thought of the bride as being an unconventional woman and, and the idea of a wedding as being a backdrop that would exert a lot of pressure on this woman who was essentially having a disassociative identity break. And so I wanted the grandmother to come to her at a moment that would be extraordinarily inconvenient for the bride and the wedding. And I tried, I wrote, I wrote it at first as kind of like a garden variety ghost and it wasn't working. And I feel like turning her into a bird is just an extension of the question, what if? Well, what if she came as this? What if she came as an idea or a shadow or a curtain or a, you know, as I spiral into all of the different ideas that she could be. And I, I myself love tiny things, tiny flying things and had a parakeet when I was little. And I've also written about the Brooklyn monk parakeets in Brooklyn the kind of accidental immigrants that they were. And so all of that kind of melded together and, and turned into a good recipe to explore how difficult it still is to, to be a woman who doesn't want the things she's in quotes supposed to want. 
perhaps you can empathize, Mega, since your book also <laughs> explores some of that feminine desire in different ways as well, and women who are unfairly judged by society. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say really quickly that, like, I found it so moving, this idea of your loved one coming to you as a bird, because I think, you know, I was thinking back to after um, I lost my grandparents and there's this great desire for some kind of sign, right? There's this great mm -hmm. desire for something to let you know that there is not just absence, that there is something else, right? Mm -hmm. um, and to take that place of emotion and turn it into something which is, which holds that emotion, but is also so funny, I think is just masterful. Um, Thank you. Right after I wrote the first chapters, Laura Vandenberg, who is a writer who I deeply admire and respect, tweeted something about how grandmother coming back as a ghost, that kind of story is, is she didn't say dead. It was very nice. Laura is an extremely nice person, but she was essentially like, that story is over. Everyone stay away from the grandmother coming back. The dead grandmother story, I think, is what she tweeted or she posted an article. And I asked her about it. I said, I had just written the beginning of this dead grandmother story. And she didn't remember even tweeting it. But it's funny how, you know, the universe conspires sometimes to, um, to make you laugh in certain ways. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to tell you that you're on the right track or on the wrong track, as the case may be. <laughs> I took it as a good sign. I took it as a good sign. Yeah. Can I ask you a craft question? Yes, please. Are we to me? But yes, I, I, I super love what you're saying about missing loved ones, because I, I also look for... I also look for signs that remind me of, of the ones that I've lost in the natural world. And who's to say, you know, who's, mm -hmm. who's to say? Mm -hmm. Certainly not, certainly not me. Um, this is a very nitty gritty craft on the line question. Cause I wasn't sure if you were going to get a lot of those editor to editor. <laughs> I wanted to talk about love a couple it. of moments. <laughs> that I really loved. Um, so often we talk about how characters are what they notice. And my favorite novels are, have, this, have this strange thing in common where their incidental moments are also so well developed. There's no throwaway moments. And what their characters notice, even in moments that seem intermediary, the connective tissue between you know, one pivotal scene, one plot point, and another are still characterizing them. And there are two moments I wanted to read, very short moments, where I feel like these offhanded, seemingly incidental noticings accrue throughout a novel and really tell you who these characters are. So on page 151, um, page 150-151, Crowds stream past him in the opposite direction. Now and then, a child, no taller than his hip, blows a pipe whose neck unfurls and reveals a feather. So this is as he's walking through, like from one place to another. And then on page 156 to 157, at the end of the night, again, he's walking. At the end of the night, when I am walking down the lane, all the shops are shuttered, other than a welder shop where a masked man is working. From the machine, bright sparks are falling on the road. In the hands of this tired man, it is like Diwali. You could have so easily had him observe nothing in those moments. You know, and, and there are moments too in Lovely's and Jivan's sections as well. Those two happen to be from his perspective. I guess my question is, how did you decide what details to include that would accrue into this rendering of India? Oh, that's such a beautiful question. I don't think anybody has asked me about these lines so far. Um, I'm so glad they caught your eye. Well, 
You know, I wanted every sentence to earn its place. And part of what I find so narratively interesting um, are moments of contradiction, you know, where you're walking down the road and somebody is working at a welder's shop and there are these sparks flying and it's just this grimy, humble operation. There is nothing festive about it. But what if you are able to see something festive in that? What if it reminds you of a certain kind of celebration? And, you know, I think it's part of showing that this character is so full of hope and is looking for something positive um, wherever they can. And the other place you pointed out, you know, the, this character is actually walking to, um, uh, a pretty, uh, you know, dark ceremony. It's it's a pretty grim ceremony. It's there's no joy in it. But he's walking during this time of festival, and so this like I was also drawing in stuff that I saw growing up in India. So during festivals, the thing that everybody would get annoyed at would be these obnoxious pipes that every kid acquired, where you have like the neck roll out. Mm -hmm. as you blow into it. I don't know if you've seen them, but every kid has them. Um, every parent is so annoyed that they bought their kid this pipe. And so I just wanted to have that tiny detail, which felt so true to me in the book. It was so important to me to have details that felt true and that were not just easy or, or borrowed. Um, yeah, thank you for reading so carefully. Um, I think one thing that I've been thinking about um, staying on questions of craft is um, the work that humor does in, in both of these books. I think that looking at them, one might think that these books have no resonances whatsoever, but I was really beautifully surprised to find so many jumping out at me. And one of these is the work of humor. Um, can you talk about why it was important for you to have all of these hilarious lines and this hilarious take and, and just a spirit of lightheartedness in the book? Sure. I, I think there is only one scene that someone has mentioned to me has made them laugh out loud. And I'm mentioning that because that, that is the only thing I've heard that is funny in the book specifically. People are mentioning its humor and I do confess, I felt like this was the least funny thing. I mean, there are dark, 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 dark. there is a scene of ex extreme violence in the book and um, some of the darkest ideas I've ever let my imagination wander into. And I guess there is something in my style or my nature that even when I think I am writing the saddest, darkest thing, it's still, Maybe because of the bluntness. I do always think of what George Saunders said about humor, which is that it's being told the truth more directly and faster, more quickly than you're used to. Hmm. And I feel like that's the only reason I can come up with that people are laughing at some of these lines. There's a moment in the museum when the bride has transmogrified into a hideous form to herself. And it's essentially a, th a three page fart joke. I do acknowledge that that could make some people laugh on a level that I never thought I would write in my life. I actually don't like that kind of humor at all, but I am able to recognize that that is a kind of humor at least. But I, I have to say, I think maybe just juxtaposing very irreverent with very dark creates this, this spark of humor that I don't think I'm necessarily always trying for. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know enough to know it's there because I've heard this enough, but I'm not always trying for it, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah. It's a matter of being, of like refusing to match tone with circumstance. So for instance, the character Simone doesn't take anything seriously. So if she walks into a complete annihilation of a party and acts like the, as casual as can be, that juxtaposition could maybe be funny. Mm -hmm. it, it was, did, you, did you have more control over yourself when you were <laughs> writing Mega than I did, I, I hope? 
what, what is your relationship to humor in a burning? Um, I think humor in this book comes um, largely from one character whose name is Lovely. And she's somebody who is so marginalized, but she holds on to this wild dream, which is to become a movie star. And I think so much of her humor comes from refusing to accept the constraints that society puts upon her. You know, she's surrounded by people who try to shame her and who try to convince her that she can never be, you know, any kind of actor with any kind of glory, but she refuses to accept that shame. You know, she teases people, she jokes with them, she throws their shame back at them. And I think her humor comes from living with defiance and having to carve her own path in a society which is constantly trying to tell her, no, you stay down there, mm -hmm. um, you know? And I'll, I'll just flow into another craft question from here, which is that one thing that I was so struck by is that, um, you know, my book, I stayed so completely in the realist space, but one thing that I so enjoyed in Parakeet was these surreal departures. I mean, of course, it starts with um, the appearance of a bird who is communicating in some way. There's a beautiful, very strange scene in which a character considers the life that she could have had. Um, and these surreal departures just feel so effort. It's kind of like the book is just taking flight and it's like going into the space. Did you, how did you build these surreal departures into the book? Well, with respect, I think the realistic scenes in my book are truly the departures. <laughs> <laughs> Love respectfully, that. Respectfully. It, it was hard to rein it in. Um, <laughs> I, you know, along with humor, breaking the laws of physics in my work is a way I've always been able to access the particular emotional truths that I want to access. I've only ever been able to get there myself by saying, instead of she's, ex she's considering the life she may have had, instead of saying that, saying she is literally spending a night with herself on an alternate timeline. She is literally running into herself on a street in Brooklyn and then allowing all the, the identity refractions that ripple out from that choice to just exist. As in, will she recognize herself? Is she taller than herself? Is she happier? Who is her partner? Um, is she going to hit on that partner? Things like that. And so by making the metaphorical literal, I'm able to play around with the ideas of, of romance, love, siblinghood, trauma that I, that I want to play around with. Trauma specifically in, in this novel and how it can kind of also be a supernatural experience in that it creates a portal that gets you to a different part of yourself to a different place. And, it's, and again, there, instead of having that be a metaphorical portal, I make it a literal portal in moments. And so, I don't know, that's, that's always been, I've just always wanted to mess around with physics. You know, I just, I tried to write realistically, especially in school when we're kind of encouraged to do so. And finally, even my most realistic professor said, you know, you're just better when you're, when you just eschew with the realistic completely. And I was like, finally, thank you. Uh, yeah. um, oh, I see, was just going to say, we are very lucky to have your surrealist work. Thank you. Um, speaking of lovely, one thing I was thinking when you were mentioning her humor, which I enjoyed so much as well. Um, her voice is so specific of the three protagonists. She has the most stylized, voice. Can you, can you talk a little about how you went about composing that voice? Um, so Lovely is this character who speaks in a kind of 
non-standard, you might say broken English. And part of what I wanted to have in this book was this character who is not bookish. You know, she's not a person who really spends that much time with books. She's not interested in book learning. Books have done nothing for her. And at the same time, she recognizes that she has to learn English in order to get better roles, in order to move up in life. This is so much of the lesson that I absorbed growing up in India, where, you know, English is the language of the colonizer, of course, and now it's the language of the elite. It's the language of aspiration. Um, if you go to India, you'll see so many um, spoken English businesses where like people go to get fluent in English so that they can get better jobs. And so this link between English and aspiration is so strong in India. And I wanted to have that in Lovely's life. I wanted to have her English be an English that is completely hers, an English that settles into the nooks and crannies of her life, but still contains so much hope and so much striving. Mm hmm Yeah. And the male character, can you say his name? Because I haven't heard it out loud yet. So he is referred to as PT Sir, which is actually, um, you know, what we would call our physical education teachers in India, we called it physical training. And the, it was always usually a male teacher who taught it and we would call him PT Sir. And that's kind of how I started writing this character. And then I just decided to stick with that. <laughs> Okay, I love that. I just hadn't heard it out loud, so I didn't want to, I didn't want to um, mispronounce his name. And he is in third person, right? That's right, yeah. Um, Can, is there a reason that you had him in third and the other two in first? Again, just like a super nerdy <laughs> editor's question. I was like, oh, I wonder why she decided to do that. I think with the other two characters, I wanted to be so close to their pain, and their joy and with this character the school teacher who becomes involved with this nationalist party and kind of has to make certain moral choices i wanted the reader to be able to view his choices critically and have a little bit of distance from him mm -hmm. um, and third person felt right for that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, i think in few minutes we can probably open it up for questions but before we do that Marie I have to ask you the thing that I really really want to learn from you how did you write a second book after your first book <laughs> oh uh, <laughs> um, are you talking about parakeet no, I'm talking about 2 a.m. at the Cat's Pajamas. Okay. Well, you can oh. talk about Parakeet too, whichever. Okay. Well, no, that's, easy. that's actually easier to answer. So that's, that's great. <laughs> well, Save This House is my first collection and Cat's Pajamas, my first novel. I was writing alongside one another. And mm. so when I shelved Cat's Pajamas, the longest time was two years. I would work on stories. So I was very much going back and forth. And I have to say, I have to recommend, if you possibly can, turning from a novel, having something else to do when you mm. inevitably have to run screaming from your novel. I mean, that's built into the revision process, really. Just the run screaming part, eventually you'll come back, but you know, abandoning it and coming <laughs> back, I think, is part of it. And so having stories, having nonfiction essays, having, I mean, and then of course, all the other things in life, like um, what are the other things in life? Cooking and playing <laughs> drums and <laughs> embroidery. All of those things are nice to have because a novel is hard work. Yeah. And then if you had asked me, how did I write Parakeet after Cat's Pajamas, which was much more, much, much, much more difficult. I just had, I, I don't often force myself to write in that case, I did force myself to sit down and answer a writing prompt and just get to it. Because I think writing begets writing and nothing helps you move away from a project like another project. So does that help? Are you, but you're working on another novel. I, I've read all of your interviews and heard all of your interviews. 
So I know that you're already working on something, right? You said first draft. I am working very slowly on something, but it's, it's really hard. It's really hard. Um, I think I might already be at the stage of run screaming from the draft, even though <laughs> I don't have a full draft yet, but I like your advice of setting it down and stepping away from it. Um, speaking of which, like you're, you've been an editor too. So you have lots of things to step away too. Yes, I'm not currently editing, but I am teaching and teaching is a very fun thing. The classroom is a very fun place to step into uh, to rejuvenate your own creative process, that's for sure. Um, so yeah, yeah, all of those good, great things in life that aren't writing, that are also kind of writing at the same time. And also, you know, never end, you know, we're also in a pandemic and we are also in a very, very profoundly acute time for race in this country, the legs of which we haven't seen in many years. Thank God. And hopefully a time of that this unrest will produce great change. So if you're having trouble writing a creative project, go easy on yourself, go easy. That's the only unsolicited, unsolicited advice <laughs> I would give. I think that we, all of us who are hard on ourselves, even in non-pandemic years, might go a little easy this year because it's not easy getting through all of this. And I, for one, feel very heavy and heavy with just collective grief. We are all grieving together. We are all feeling the heaviness when, whether we know it or not. So I think it might, it might be okay that it's hard to write right now, you know? Brilliance awaits, Mega. It will, it will come later. It will be there for you, I know it. Hmm. Um. All right, well, I'll just jump in here yeah. and ask you guys a few questions. Uh, and the first question actually kind of has to tie in a little bit. Um, someone asked, they'd love to know what your writing processes look like day to day and if you're still able to write during this pandemic and unrest. Um, I can go first. Um, my writing process day to day, well, I work full time as an editor with um, a small press called Catapult, where actually Marie was my colleague a while ago. Um, so writing for me often looks like a few minutes before work um, in the mornings. And sometimes that's no more than 15 or 20 minutes before I have to jump into emails for the day. Um, but I think a big part <laughs> of my process is staying in touch with the pages um, and even if I'm not able to add any kind of good paragraph or good sentence that day, if I'm able to just read what I have and let that world be animate in my mind, I find that so helpful. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think that's amazing, the morning pages. That's wonderful. I, if I had my druthers, I would wake up and immediately write to such, a, concentration that I wouldn't be able to hear my name being called until around 3 p.m. when I would kind of emerge from that creative cocoon starving. Um, I so rarely have my druthers, but that, but that would be it. That would be my writing process. Um, I'm not currently writing right now. I think what I would say that I'm doing is taking notes and gathering, writing things down, but I just as I told you to go easy on yourself, Mega. I'm also telling myself because I just, I just don't think, I just don't think right now is, is a, is going to be a very fruitful writing time for me. All right, here's a question for Mega. Uh, one of the things I loved about this novel were the three completely different authentic human voices, wondering which voice came to you first. <laughs> um, I think one of the early characters that I had was actually an iteration of Jeevan. Um, and the iteration that I had was um, this kind of high emotion, like dramatic image of a child fleeing on a coal train um, in order to seek some kind of better life for themselves and for their parents. And that place of 
a child seeking to protect their parents stayed with me. And from that kernel, I kind of teased a narrative out of it um, to form Jeevan. All right. Can you, uh, can you both talk about what novels you had in mind when you were writing, uh, what your influences were? Ooh, Do you want to go you, first, Marie? Oh, I just went completely blank as if I have I never read a novel. <laughs> Will you go first while I think about sure. it? I've read a novel? Thank yeah. you. Um, you know, I, I know that some people have an answer which is like this foundational novel for them. I'm afraid I don't have a book like that. I think I, I learned something from every book that I read. Um, you know, I grew up reading mysteries and travel writing, whatever I could find at these secondhand shops that my parents took me to. I absorbed so much about suspense and velocity and motion from those books, I think. Um, and more recently, I've loved books by people like um, Daniel Moinuddin. He is a, I think he's a Pakistani writer. His book is set in Pakistan, and it's called In Other Rooms, Other Wonders, which is a mm -hmm. beautiful title, uh, collection of stories. I wanted that richness in my book. Um, I've loved complex child characters. Um, like in No Violet Bulawayo's book, um, We Need New Names, which I actually have here because I was recommending it to somebody else. I'll just show you the cover. Um, it's a really gorgeous book, which came out a few years ago. Very mischievous, skeptical, cynical children um, whom I really loved. Amazing. I love those books. That's one of the best titles ever, In Other Rooms, Other Wonders. I love that title. So for me, I just remembered, when I was describing the bananas plot points of Parakeet to my agent, I remember saying, don't think of any books, think of a Pedro Amaldivar movie. And that, in that way, I kind of tried to explain to her that all of the banana stuff could exist in the same volume. And then as far as writers, particularly for Parakeet, I would say Shirley Jackson, especially The Haunting of Hill House, and uh, Yoko Ogawa's collection, Revenge, which is seminal, seminal for me. You know, women on the edge, women walking the, ed the periphery of society because they refuse to ascribe to any so-called norms um, in, in the stories of revenge, highly recommend. Right, that's it. Thank you, Mega Marie, for two fantastic books. My question to Mega relates to the theme of a burning. I felt a sense of urgency, hopelessness, moral ethical dilemma, but also felt hopeful in some moments in the book, which is very much characteristic of contemporary India. What brought you to weave through these complex juxtapositions of morality, hope, and hopelessness through the lens of marginalization in India? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, you know, I knew that I wanted to write a book which would respond to the rise of the right, a book that would respond to the rise of this hatred-filled, xenophobic nationalism. And I wanted to do it by looking at how ordinary people, um, people with scarce resources, still chase big dreams, you know, they still fall in love, they still make jokes, um, they still try to make a better life for themselves and their families. Um, and I think that spirit was what I really wanted to focus on as a novelist. I drew so much inspiration from journalism um, and scholarship being done around um, the rise of nationalism in India. But for me, the imaginative space where I wanted to be was the lives of these people who strive and dream of big things, even though they are living in these conditions of systemic oppression. This question is backgrounded by a famously filthy rich writer denying personhood to trans people. Both of you include a transgender or non-binary character in your novel. Could you oh. take a moment to speak to what it means to you to write across your experience and what importance representation holds in your work? Sure, Mega, would you like to go first? 
Sure. Um, I think Lovely's character, I just wanted to write this joyous arc, you know, and I wanted to follow somebody who is marginalized in really complex ways. So Lovely is a hijra, which, you know, is, is a very particular Indian category um, at the intersection of um, class and religion and gender. So I wanted to see how somebody goes from living at this intersection of various kinds of oppression to chase this dream of being at the very center of public life. You know, I wanted to have this character who has this defiant, bold, courageous, joyous arc. Um, and yeah, I think I wanted to write a person with complexity and nuance and big dreams and a person who resists her whole life is a form of um, hope and aspiration that presents resistance to the system. So it was very important to me to write this character. It took me a moment to realize that the, the question, the background character was JK Rowling. And so I must assume that you're talking about her very unfortunate, gross, wrong, incorrect, and dangerous comments that she's been making on Twitter, or her transphobic comments. Thank you for asking this question, because representation is very important to me. And OK, I'm going to try to be succinct here, because this actually goes very deep for me. Um, when I decided to write the character of Simone, and I realized I would be writing across my experience, the first question I asked myself, and this is a question I insist that my students ask themselves when writing across their experience. And please let me say that when I say writing across the experience, um, if there are any you know, emerging writers listening, I mean race, ability, gender, sexuality, class. Um, and so when I realized I would be writing ac across mine, the first question I had to answer was why? Why must I write this character, Simone, who is trans? I am not trans. And I really had to make sure that the answer was satisfactory, that it wasn't uh, to in some way, that I wouldn't be condescending to her, that I wouldn't be cheapening the, the experience of being a trans woman, that I wouldn't in any way allow the text itself to become an agent of transphobia. And so I had to do my homework, my research. I, I interviewed people. I mean, I, I did this because I have trans friends because this issue um, goes very deep for me. Um, why what J.K. Rowling says is so dangerous is because trans youth, especially native trans youth, are the most at-risk demographic in America right now. That means they are the most likely to consider and or commit suicide. As recently as last night, I had a friend call me who um, is dealing with her family, throwing her out for coming out as queer and dating a trans woman. It is a very, very dangerous thing to limit someone through language, to deny them through language, to deny their lived experience. So after I interviewed and after I did my research, um, I made sure I wasn't, I made sure I wasn't furthering any stereotypes. I wasn't speaking down to Simone. And I had to answer certain craft questions such as how to let her tell her own story. She was in the point of view of the bride. I did not feel comfortable writing from the point of view of Simone. That was one of, one of my rules. So I, I could write across my experience, but I drew the line at speaking from her own experience. So to solve the craft question of how to literally have her step out of the bride's point of view, which could limit her, I had Simone tell a monologue. It was a very simple way of fixing that problem. I literally had her tell her own story, um, unattributed, 
with no interruption from the bride, even in dialogue tags. Um, and then finally, I hired a very brilliant, lovely person who became a very good friend, Grace Lavery, who is a trans professor at UC Berkeley. And I said, you know, fill in the gaps for me and tell me what I can't possibly know because it is not my lived experience. And um, she helped me and we became very close and I learned a lot. And so that's, that's how I, that's some of, those are some of the ways that I wrote across my experience. And I just wanna say again, how important it is to do all of those things, but to first answer the question, why is it important for me to do this? And then to make sure you do it with linguistic dignity because they are characters on a page, but they are real people who have real, real lives. And so when JK Rowling talks about trans folks inaccurately, she's not messing with a 12 year old wizard's life. She's messing with real people who I know. And so not a fan <laughs> of hers anymore. And I thank you for that question. It's very, very important. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Um, before that, I just wanted to say thank you again to Megan and Marie for sharing your time and your beautiful work and your lovely insights with us. Thank and again, you. we have both of your books for sale in Green Apple Books, um, or I just would encourage you to buy them wherever you can. Uh, so our last question tonight is, can you both talk a little bit about that initial kernel of an idea and how you go about developing it into something bigger, a short story or a novel? How do you know it has potential to grow? Well, I think, I think I've talked enough, Mega, so why don't you take that one? Um, I think staying really close to what makes you angry um, and what makes you sad is a way of moving close to that kernel of what you have to say. I think um, I, I spent a lot of time developing this, this kind of, I mean, I, I had this idea, I knew that I wanted to say something about the rise of the right, but developing it into a story, I think the only way that I knew it would be a book was by writing the book, unfortunately, you know, I. I had a little bit of emotion and something to say. And first it was, you know, a page. And then at some point it was 10 pages. And at some point it was 200 pages, you know? And so I think um, there are craft things that you can do to, to develop your idea. So once you have this idea of something you want to say, a question you want to ask, something that you feel compelled to comment on in the world, then you know you can look to things like um, establishing clarity, like tell the reader where we are, who the characters are, what time period are we in, invite a reader into the story in that way. Then establish, you know, I worked on establishing what the stakes are. You know, why should a reader care about this world that I made up? Why should a reader care about these made up people? So establishing stakes felt really important, giving the reader real connections and, and a semblance of truth to care about. Um, and then, you know, you can just unspool this into so many craft considerations. You can think about, well, I have a paragraph. Where is this going? What do my characters want to do? How can they move in space and in emotional scale and register so that their experience feels truthful? Um, so I think a lot of what you're asking is probably a craft question. And um, I know that some people outline on that kind of thing. I haven't done it yet. So maybe an outline is a good way to know if you have a book before you write the book. But for me, writing was the only way to do it. What do you think, Marie? <laughs> How to keep the germ alive. Oof, sometimes it's just unbiddable moxie you just have to keep going and just you know I, I think I think even deciding what would make a good novel 
initially is the hardest part. And so hopefully you fix on something that you don't, that you can stay in love with for seven, eight, nine, 10 years. So you're cultivating the ability to know when you're in love, to know that you're in love with this particular germ and that you can spend a lot of time with it. It's beautiful. <laughs> That was Marcello, by the way, my dog who just walked by to say hello. He was in the background <laughs> for a moment and he just heard his name. So here he is. <laughs> All right. With, well, with that, I think we'll, we'll call it a night. But thank you again. And thank you, everyone, for, for joining us tonight. Thank, thank you, Emily. So much, thank Emily. you, Mega. Thank you, Marie. So thank happy you. to get to do this with you. Me too. And congratulations on all the beautiful, beautiful, beautiful press. May it congratulations never end. Congratulations to you. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. I'm learning so much from you. Oh, God. Well, then I'm sorry for you, truly. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, honey. <laughs>